In this particular talk, we're going to have a look at the process of compilation within C++. We're building upon the first one. So in the first talk, we, we broadly look at the process of translation from converting our source code into some executable machine form. We mentioned that compilation was one of the techniques where we will do all of the, if you like, translation up front, produce an executable program, we can then run that at the end. So we want to break up our, our, our process of compilation into a number of distinct phases. Other than being useful to know, there are real benefits in understanding and looking at this process. Um, I'll, I'll read it out, but then we'll sort of go over it a little bit of my fault. But by understanding the process, process of compilation, and in particular how the compiler tries to optimize our code. So we want to, to look at what the compiler tries to do, how it tries to improve upon the source code that we've written. We'll touch upon it in this talk, it'll really be the next uh, lecture in the series, but we'll delve into a little bit more detail. If we understand that, it means then that we can write code as programmers, that the compiler is going to find easier to understand. And if it finds it easier to understand, because we've written in a way where we know what it's going to try to do with it, it's then going to find it easier to be able to optimize. So ultimately, we can write things in a way that will help the compiler help us. So ultimately, we stand to benefit. But we'll see that. We'll see a bit in this here, but more so in, in the next talk. As to the, the different uh, phases, different stages we have within the compilation process, you can see I have an overview of them here. Um, so lexical analysis to syntax analysis uh, for intermediate to native code generation and, and the whole process of code optimization. This is presented in the list. It's not to say you go through one automatically falls into the next, follows into the next. Um, as we go through this, you, you, you'll sort of see in the next slide that it's going to be the parser, the syntax analyzer that, that often sequences the process and it'll then go to the scanner, to the lexical analyzer to get some uh, d d tokens or lexemes from our source code. It'll pass some of those off to be generated. It'll be turned into some sort of intermediate code, sort of fairly close, almost like bytecode. The sum optimizations will be applied. It'll then be tied down to a particular platform or target CPU. And again, maybe more optimizations being applied to it. So how we, we go through these phases, we can bounce from one to the next. It's not a linear sequence from start to end. It's, it's a bit more iterative in terms of how uh, the total process uh, evolves. First one we'll mention here, I suppose the one often does control the thing, is, is the parser syntax analyzer. It's really uh, responsible for working out if what we've written as programmers adheres to the rules of the language. It makes logical syntactic sense. It's something that potentially um, can be turned into a legal uh, set of, of machine instructions. So if you like, it's, it's the rule book that makes sure that we're writing valid code. Um, well, it does a number of things. One of the things is, is checking that it is syntactically uh, valid. Now, to do that, it's going to call the scanner, the lexical parser. Uh, we'll have a look at that on, on, on the next slide. It'll extract some tokens from the textual source code. They'll then be checked to see if they're valid. Um, and, and it'll then go on, it'll admit it then to turn it into code and then to repeat the process. Um, we'll look at the parser again a couple of slides down. It's going to have another uh, role in terms of developing up a sort of a, a structure of the overall program as it, as it gets to be um, uh, parsed. So the lexical analysis then, uh, the scanner, its job is to detect the source code, the characters that we have written, and to turn this into some sort of more compact, more, more quickly parsable form. Uh, so for example, the, the example is given here in this slide. If we have the character string, the character six, followed by the character seven, followed by the character five, and I had this somewhere within my program, it's the job of the, the scanner, uh, lexical analyzer, to work out what does that sequence of character six, seven, five actually correspond to. Now, if, if it was a, uh, as a number that I put in, then it would be up to the lexical analyzer to look at the context on the other side to say, okay, this is how I'm going to interpret it. It might then say this uh, 675 has been interpreted as a literal constant. So it's, it's a constant, doesn't change its value. It's a literal, it's just an actual expression of a number. Uh, the particular type of number we're expressing here is an integer. I didn't do 675.0. Um, and has a numerical attribute value of 675. Um, 
as, as similar to, with the, the normal translators, the whole benefit of, of doing this process and getting out of the way is it does take time and effort to go through the characters that we've typed in and to understand what they mean and how we can safely interpret them. Uh, but once we've done that, it then opens up for all of the subsequent parsing. It's going to be much more quicker to happen because we're not dealing with, with sort of cumbersome character sequences. We're dealing with parsed data at that particular point. The uh, parser itself, the syntax analyzer, as mentioned, part of its, its job is to make sure that what we've typed in is syntactically valid. We don't have any syntax errors, things that don't correspond to the rules of the language. Beyond that, the parser also constructs what's known as an abstract uh, syntax uh, tree or an AST. It's a, um, a tree-like structure that really sort of embodies the the, the program, the, the different phases and steps. So depending on the branches that you have within it for the different if conditions, you can go down one part of the tree or follow another part of the tree. Um, it's important to build that up because that really is, is a sort of an executable oriented view of the, the program. And if we have that AST tree, that's the type of thing we can then push off uh, for something to look at in terms of say optimization to work out, can we have a more efficient form of that tree? Or we can take the tree and start turning it into to native machine code. So ultimately, our, our, our textual sort of top of the source file to the bottom of the source file gets turned into some tree-like structure that embodies um, the flow of control uh, through the, the particular program. For code generation itself then, um, a certain amount of, when the parser has a certain amount parsed, it'll push it off then to be uh, turned into uh, into, into machine code. Often, before we get down to something that is platform specific, we'll, ha we'll have a sort of an intermediate phase, something that's producing it so fairly close uh, to machine code, or it may actually be machine code for like a sort of generic, say, MIPS platform or whatever, not necessarily one tied into a, a specific platform. Um, reason for doing this, uh, but having that first phase, whenever you've done that first conversion, it then opens up a number of sort of fairly generic forms of optimization you can apply. Um, at that point, it's not tied necessarily down to one specific platform or CPU. So you've sort of done a lot of high-level stuff. Uh, second phase after that, if you're doing native for a particular target CPU, you can tie it down to that. And there may be some implementations or performance enhancements which are specific to that CPU that you can then uh, put in place. So it's, it's a flexible way of, of, of sort of breaking this up so you can target compilation against multiple types of, 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 of target CPU. Code optimization itself, as mentioned, this can run uh, both at the intermediate and at the native stage. Um, in essence, in, in simple form, the, the job of the optimizer is to take the, the abstract syntax tree, the, the, if you like, the program flow, to keep it fundamentally the same, um, so it doesn't change how the, behave, the program is meant to behave, but to look to see is there anything inefficient within the tree. So anything in any way you can change the tree or to remove bits from it so you keep the same overall net outcome but you do it in a more efficient manner. And there's lots of different uh, techniques that can be used. I'm going to show you a few examples of, to be honest, simple, silly ones, but they sort of illustrate some of the types of, of activity that, that uh, an optimizer might actually do. But in the next lecture uh, we'll, we'll have a look at this in a bit more detail. So for example, uh, line 3 over on the left hand side we're saying a uh, index 0 is equal to i plus 0. Uh, so there if we add on 0 we could have one rule and the optimizer would realize is if you add 0 to a number it doesn't change it. So that since you would omit the instruction to add on 0. If you're multiplying by 0 it's just going to be 0 output. i minus i if that's the calculation it turns out to be again you know that's just going to be 0. Or if you had a piece of code that turned out to be 1 plus i plus 1 as opposed to having those separate instructions to add together the different bits, just say 2 plus i. Um, so they're, they're, they're sillily obvious examples, but that's the type of, of modification we could potentially make that would have the same net outcome, um, but would be a little bit more efficient. As to some more examples, so for example, the method here foo, we are creating a local integer i, we're assigning it equal to 1, and then we're never using it. So there's no point in this sense. That would be a bit of our, our AST tree that, that uh, doesn't actually have any impact at all. It's not actually used. So a good compiler can recognize and detect that and simply omit it. 
Um, line five, uh, we set global to be one, then we set global to be two, and then line eight after the return, we set it to be three. So in this sense, the, there's only line six setting global equal to two is the meaningful one, um, because the other ones are not used anywhere or not reachable. So in that sense, we can simplify it down to that as well. So in essence, the optimizer goes through, doesn't want to change the overall outcome, what happens, but it wants to work out, has it been implemented in a way which is not necessarily as efficient as it could be, could be improved. And as mentioned, next lecture, we'll have a look at some techniques for doing that. Um, linkers then, so strictly speaking, you have a compiler. The compiler compiles our source code down to machine code. A linker then follows on after it, and its job is to take these, the, the object code in essence, and, and to link them together into final executable data, and a, a, sort of a, a loader and things like that as well. So compiler, as mentioned, translates source code into sort of machine code or machine-like code, object code. Um, a linker can come along. Normally, uh, the projects that we write, we will have multiple different source files. Each source file in C++ is compiled independently. So if I have foo.cpp, I'll end up with foo.o for an object file at the end. If I have a separate file, I'll get a separate object file for that. The job of the linker is to take all of these separate files and to link them together, join them up into a single whole. If I'm making use of a library function, um, because I, 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 I want to make use of that, again, the job of the linker will be go off and to link in the executable from that library or the relevant bits of it, and to piece the whole thing together into a single executable. And then, then we'll add in some sort of, sort of loader to get the thing loaded into memory and executed in the first place. So that's the job of the linker, to do all of that. Um, there, there's a number of different sort of tools that can be used here and there, there's a degree of commonality in terms of object file formats between certainly C++ compilers. Um, you can see some of the sort of common formats down at the bottom and it means then that people writing uh, sort of disassemblers or other sort of linkage tools that they can write it in a way that where things work across multiple different types of object file um, formats. That again, helps by being a little bit flexible. Just a small aside here, in, in, in terms of a, a few other things to, to mention, maybe pertinent to this, this course, um, there are lots of different types of C++ compilers. Uh, in this particular course, we're using uh, Visual C++. Uh, one of the more popular ones is actually quite a, is an excellent compiler um, that Microsoft's had many, many years sort of putting together in terms of, of its implementation. Um, when we're using uh, MS Visual C++, you know, need to, I suppose, just simply acknowledge that we're using the normal Visual Studio IDE, the integrated development environment, to create our code, to make use of the tools, to all of those other things. But whenever we compile it, uh, then it's been handed off to the compiler through to the linker, ultimately to end up with the executable um, at the end. You'll notice that whenever you're creating your C++ uh, code, there'll be lots of different targets that you can create one for. Um, from building a DLL to something that's you know 30 or 64 bit Windows or just ordinary console application. Um, so again, that ties into the fact that whenever um, that whenever you are uh, compiling uh, or, or creating a C++ project, you need to say what is the target platform that you're building it for. When we were doing Java, we, we just built our Java things. We had a bunch of class files and we could deploy them wherever we wanted to. Here, we need to be explicit in terms of, well, what are we ultimately going to run this thing on? Um, other thing to just to mention here, um, in, in terms of the compile, build and make, build all, run, execute and debug, um, there's a more meaningful distinction between debug and release mode. Uh, so if we are using debug mode, um, what happens is that the compiler actually adds in additional code, adds in a whole bunch of breakpoints and other things that it monitors, so that it gives us an opportunity to be able to, to pause, to step into, to look at our, our program as it is actually running, to run it in debug mode. So that makes the program bigger, slows it down, but it's useful because then we have access to all of the debug tools. If we turn into release mode, there we're saying we're happy with the program, we've tested it, we don't want any of the additional stuff. Release mode will just uh, compile it purely. You'll not have any of the debug stuff or other stuff, and it'll run as fast as the thing then uh, possibly can. So usual thing uh, in terms of creating C++, you'll, you'll develop into debug mode initially until you're happy with it. Ultimately, you want to push it out on uh, in release mode. 
So key takeaway for, for this one, um, a good compiler, which we will be using, is going to actually work hard um, to help us, uh, to help our code be as fast or as, as compact as possible. And we'll look in the next talk about how uh, it can do that. What we want to remember in this case here is that we do want to understand how it tries to do this because we can write code that will either help it do this to be able to understand it easily or we can write code where the optimizer isn't going to struggle to understand what it is we're trying to do and then we'll struggle uh, to introduce any form of optimization. But you'll see that in the, uh, the next lecture.